on a roll. I'd like to buy your time. So here we go. Welcome everyone to All In On Real Estate. I'm your host, Aaron Goins. I started this meetup because when I was in the military, no one in my circles talked about real estate. A lot of times they talked about uh, debt, finances, stocks and bonds, but no one talked about real estate. And I want to start a meetup where people can learn about real, real estate, educate themselves as much as possible, and then start building generational wealth for, for them and their families. So I'm very, very excited for our guest speaker today, Mr. Chris Roberts. Um, I've had conversations with Chris uh, last year, and he blew me away with the conversation we had. And I tell you this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big podcast uh, listener. And, you know, my couple of my, my go-to podcasts is the Capital Razor Show, is Secret Success Podcast, and also uh, um, John Kasman's podcast. Um, and a top two interview I heard was with, on the Capital Razor Show was episode 156 with Mr. Chris Roberts. He blew me away. I had listened to that, that episode at least i probably say at least eight, nine, 10 times. Um, I love that. I love that episode. Um, I learned so much. Um, and uh, Chris, man, welcome to All In On Real Estate. How you doing, man? Aaron, I'm great, man. Thanks so much for having me and uh, appreciate the introduction. It's uh, always cool, man, to be uh, recognized and given accolades. I mean, we're all out there hustling, trying to do our thing. And it's, uh, it's cool, man. It's cool to be here and, and share with everybody. Yeah, this is a long time coming, and, and uh, but I'm I'm very very excited, man. Um, I, I know you're gonna bless everybody with your knowledge. Um, just you know, um, and then every, everything you're doing right now too, like we said before before we um, start this meetup. But uh, please introduce yourself, to everybody, and, and if you want to do the slides and things like that, we can just rock and roll with that. Yeah, that'd be fine. Do you want to enable screen share? And yes. what I'll do is um, I'll spend maybe just. 15 minutes breezing through this slide deck. It's just sort of a, the basics of business. Talk a little bit about me, and then I'll dive in quickly to the company we've built. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I've owned several businesses, but the real estate business is probably what you're all here for. So we'll talk about that. And then uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time, if you guys want, just open Q&A, man, whatever you guys want to know, want to learn. Uh, I'm in the thick of it. We're doing a lot of deals. Uh, we've raised a lot of money. Uh, in, in about a two and a half, three year span, um, we've really, really grown fast. So I'm really just here to educate you guys, help you to the best of my ability. But I want to start with just a slide deck of some basics of business and whatnot, some things that my partner and I have done um, to kind of get us grounded for growing business. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background as I start this slideshow. So if you want to enable screen share, I'll... Uh, yes, sir. Cool. Get that going so you can see the screen. I assume you can see the screen, yeah? No. No, okay. How about now, no? No. Well, that's strange because I'm sharing it. That's weird. It shows I'm sharing it. Hold on, let's see here. How about now? Here we go, here we go. Woohoo! we made it, guys. All right, so you can see that? Yes. Perfect, okay. So... Real quickly, I'm just going to, I'm going to breeze through this slide deck. Um, but first I'll tell you a little bit about me. So what, what I think makes me a little bit unique in the space is the, the upbringing I had and the challenges I had when I was growing up. And it kind of set me up for an entrepreneurial mindset. And I mean, we all have challenges in our lives, right? I mean, you could think back about when you grow up, you could think about, your life today and the challenges at work, your personal experiences, um, relationships, so on and so forth. I've always been one to use the challenges that I've had to drive me forward and not look at them uh, as a way for me to make excuses and dwell. Um, I was on my own at the age of 15. Uh, you know, I was jumped by gangs growing up in California. I was picked on, um, slept on sofas, was homeless for a little short period of time. And then uh, at the age of 18, uh, came across a mentor who really kind of changed my life, actually put me on the sort of the right path, if you will. Um, didn't graduate from school. I had to go back and get my GD and took one course in college and realized uh, for me, I said it, it was kind of a waste of time because at that point I had developed an awful lot of business success and uh, was developing wealth and, and thought, you know, why am I going to put all this time and energy into this education thing? Because I was kind of learning it uh, by doing and being out on the road and, and hustling. So uh, as I as I became an entrepreneur in my early 20s, 
I started building businesses, built a sales and marketing company, uh, went out and partnered in a software company and a bunch of other little things in between, and then started buying a little bit of real estate, uh, land, fix and flips. And eventually that led to scaling, which led me into the multifamily space. We've had the company for about three years now. Um, we're probably right around the $80 million mark. Um, and then our fund has another, I don't even know, 20 or 30 million in it. Um, total doors, we have probably about 2,400 doors now uh, with our deal flow and our, and our fund. And uh, we, we've got a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of things on the horizon that we're doing to grow our brand. And we can dive into that a little bit. Uh, but before we go into the multifamily space, I want to just tell you a little bit about me and my partner and, and again, kind of our philosophy and thought process in the business here. So uh, these are the seven principles of how we kind of build a better business, build a better life. And my partner and I really focus on mindset. We focus a lot on our health, right? We, we eat healthy. We have healthy conversations. We support each other. We have a pretty good extensive team, but Paul Wilcox and I are really the founders of the company. And, uh, and it really helps to have a partnership. So if any of you are looking at building a business, just understand that, you know, while you may not be a great fit with a partnership today, you may not be seeing that or thinking that, uh, you have to be open to the possibility because you never know when you're going to come across somebody that might be a really good fit for you and complement your, your weaknesses and strengths and help you grow. And I found that in Paul, I've built many businesses. I'm an entrepreneur. He was in corporate America and he left his career to come work with me because he felt there was a great fit there and he wanted to leave his corporate job. And he had really good skills in infrastructure, spreadsheets, analytics. He came from a construction engineering background. I had the sales and marketing skills and entrepreneurial mindset. So the two of us together obviously grew our company pretty fast and it worked well, but we both had to be open to that mindset. You know, hey, am I going to go it alone? Uh, which I had that experience and it's not fun. I've done it many times and had partnerships that didn't work. Uh, or am I going to open myself up and see if I can scale with the right people on my bus, right? And I'm sure you guys have heard that term before. So we'll talk real quickly about this process. So, you know, why follow any principles? You know, you got to set goals, you got to strive, you got to serve a purpose. Um, so Paul, for example, um, he, he was really just tired of the corporate grind. You know, he's got a family, he's a really smart guy, he works hard, and he just wanted out. And he went to a couple of real estate seminars, and that's where we met. And he just thought that he, he this was his words, I'll jump on Chris's coattails and ride the wave and we'll figure it out. Because he's got the analytical skills and he knew that I wasn't going to fail. Um, just in 20 minutes of us having a conversation, which is pretty amazing because each one of us had probably talked to 50 people at that event. And for whatever reason, he and I connected. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, that's my wife, Christina on the left. That's our dog, Bentley. We have several dogs now. Uh, I'm a scuba diver, avid rescue, advanced scuba diver. I was a police reserve for almost five years in the city of Lacey. Um, I was a sales and marketing guy. I climbed mountains. I've climbed all of the volcanoes in the Northwest. And I just really, really love uh, achieving things. I love the challenge. I love doing things that scare the hell out of me, that push my limits. And that that bodes well for me in the entrepreneurial space. And so I, I, I want to point this out to you guys because oftentimes we, we want to live sort of in our comfort zone. And, and I, would, I would encourage you to get way outside your comfort zone and really push yourselves so that you can see what you actually can achieve. It's not even just in business, in your personal life. I used to be scared of heights, right? And here I am climbing 15,000 foot peaks, no problem. I used to be scared to death of the water because I had a bad experience one time scuba diving and I gave up for 10 years. And then I saw these families going into the water one time on a vacation. And I told my wife, I got to go back at it. And I did it. And now I'm an advanced rescue scuba diver. Policing. I was a guy who ran from the cops when I was a kid, man. Are you kidding me? Like I got jumped by gangs. I lived in rough neighborhoods in LA and I hated the cops. And so as I grew and matured, I wanted to learn more about my community. I wanted to give back. I wanted to teach young people. So I went through hell and joined the police academy, which was tough. Went through all that to be a volunteer police officer. I've even been shot at for crying out loud. And I did it all as a volunteer, right? Uh, but again, you've got to have a lot of passion to do stuff like that. So I, de I developed a mantra that kind of helped keep me centered, especially when I was growing up. And it was really tough growing up in some of the neighborhoods I grew up in. And I'm going to read this mantra to you, and I encourage you to start with developing your own mantra. It could be one word. It could be one sentence. It could be a picture, but uh, this was mine. Uh, I am not a victim of my environment or my circumstances, but I am the results of my actions and my attitude. And I don't have time for fear in my life because I'm out achieving my dreams. And I believe that. I believe that every day, every second, every minute. My partners know it. The people I do business with know it. We exude this confidence because we live it. We're in it. 
right? We're going after it all the time. This is not some sort of show and song and dance. This is how we live, eat, and breathe. Uh, I'm up at 4.35 every day. I'm in bed by 10 to 11 uh, at the earliest, and we grind seven days a week. And you can ask any of my investors, they know it. They're absolutely shocked that I answer my phone all hours of the day on the weekends. Number two, identify your value proposition and develop skills. Um, if you don't know what your value proposition is, you got to figure it out. Uh, your value proposition could be you have time, you have net worth, you have liquidity, uh, you're smart, you're good with spreadsheets. Um, you have time maybe uh, in the sense that you have a job, but maybe you're an independent contractor. So you're like, hey, I've got a job, so I don't have to worry so much about making a ton of money right now, but I only work four days a week. So I have three days to actually put time into my craft or my partnership in growing my real estate. And the real estate could be fix and flips. It could be um, you know, investing passively. It could be actively. It just depends on what you want to do. Uh, but what's a good value proposition? You know, well, again, what are you good at? You're good at spreadsheets. You're an introvert and extrovert. You know, what could you focus on? Could you focus on doing videos or marketing and things of that sort? Number three, write down your vision and purpose and your why and develop a framework for your business and your best life. Now, this is kind of a vague um, you know, sort of comment because we all have to adopt what feels good to us, right? But if you want to think about what is a vision and, and what, what could your why be or what would your purpose be, here are some of the examples, right? Uh, I want to be the best, best, most influential podcaster uh, of cooking, right? Or whatever it may be. Uh, I want to own a thousand apartment units. Uh, your why? I want to provide for my family. I want to be financially free, et cetera, right? Once you have these, start with your framework and strive uh, to build out your vision and your why, okay? So you need, you need to write things down. You can't see it, but I'm, I'm actually sitting in a sound room with my office all set up and whatnot. I have two offices in my property and I've got a... I think it's a five foot by eight foot uh, whiteboard on my wall on the other side of where I'm speaking with you. And we're outlining our real estate book. We're outlining um, our TED talk. We're outlining a bunch of stuff on the board, right? So we have two different offices with all kinds of stuff everywhere. And it's constantly inspiring us. You've got to write this stuff down. You've got to look at it all the time. You can even see behind me, I've got inspirational sayings and things to always keep me on track, keep me motivated. You want to build your team, then outsource, delegate, and automate. So what does that mean? Well, pretty self-explanatory. Build a few people, right? And then you want to outsource those responsibilities that you don't want to do, right? Maybe you want to delegate and you want to automate things. So once you get really good at your systems, you want to bring on things like Active Campaign or MailChimp. Um, you want to bring on, uh, let's say, 1-800 numbers or Calendly. You need to set these things up to try to make your life easier. And yes, those things cost money, but it doesn't have to cost a substantial amount of money. Uh, when we first started, we had a couple of hundred dollars a month worth of subscriptions. Now we have thousands of dollars plus overhead that we pay every month. But we're also, you know, knocking out multiple deals a year and bringing in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of income every year, right? So you have to scale, um, and you, but you got to start somewhere. If I was going to encourage you to start one place, it would be building out a CRM to communicate with your investors and or your partners and start tracking things. An active campaign is a very inexpensive one uh, that I highly recommend. It's probably $50 a month. Um, it's absolutely amazing and one of our top tools that we use, right? So here are some of the team members you might build out. Founder, uh, co-founder, vice president, uh, director of asset management, director of marketing, and so on, right? There's lots of roles that you could fill. Live below your means and then save and invest at least 40% of your income. This sounds crazy and atrocious uh, probably to most of you. I know it was to me when I first started thinking about it. But I really, I looked at that number and thought, maybe I can't do this today, but I'm going to strive to get there at some point. I'm going to really push to try to get me to that point because that's how I'm going to create financial freedom. And today I reinvest about 80% of my income. And that sounds crazy, but I live below my means and I have grown my streams of income, sometimes as high as 20 different streams of income. And all of the money I make beyond my level of living goes into reinvestment, right? And that helps me build businesses. That helps me invest in my companies. That helps give me peace of mind. It helps my family. You know, I've helped family members and that feels good. We've donated a lot. Uh, I'm, a, I'm about to write a check to get us over the 1 million meal mark with Feeding America. Um, a major goal of mine when I started when I launched my first book. And it's really exciting to be in a position to do that because I stood in food lines when I was a kid, right? So I was really highly focused on this and I encourage you to do the same thing. Your number might be 20% or 100%, but put something on paper. Um, determine where you are financially, measure your spending for 30 days, create a budget, um, measure and execute along the way. 
being, okay, I have a budget, but I'm actually holding myself accountable to that. And am I, am I measuring that along the way? Or do I just have a budget and I slip every once in a while? You've got to hold yourself accountable because oftentimes there's, there's no one else that's going to hold you accountable. Uh, cook at home, uh, measure what you're eating, fix things around the house and so on and so forth, right? Uh, don't have debt if you can help it. These are all kind of common sense, rich dad, poor dad type things, but it, it pays to re revisit these and reiterate them constantly in your own mind because we all develop bad habits and it's really hard to not fall back into those habits if you don't have reminders constantly or someone to kind of keep you on track. And if you're by yourself, uh, or especially if you're single and you don't have a significant other, uh, you're going to have to have something in your office to kind of keep you on track, right? So build multiple businesses, creating multiple streams of income. I told you earlier, uh, my the biggest mistake I made was I didn't start creating multiple streams of income early enough. And I wish I would. And I remember one person told me in, in the sales and marketing company I was in, man, you need multiple streams of income. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, you got to pick up these other lines. You got to hustle on the side here. You got to do this and that. I didn't think much about it. And I'm like, but I have this job. He goes, yeah, but are you really good at this? Yeah, man, I win all the awards and I'm, I'm doing great. And he goes, well, then, I mean, don't you think that you could peel off a little bit of that attention and put it into something else to create some cash flow? And I started thinking about that. I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm giving 120%. What if I give 100% and peel that extra 20 I'm giving off to creating another stream of income? And I did that. And as I said, at my peak, I think I had probably 20 streams of income. I don't even know, to be honest with you, it could be higher today. Um, I know it dipped a little bit when we sold some assets and whatnot, but um, that's amazing, right? Um, I put myself in a position today to literally live off the passive cash flow uh, and be financially free. And I'm 44 years old. I never in my wildest dreams would have thought I'd be there. Um, so you could become a subcontractor offering your skills for price. Um, you could invest in real estate, dividends and cash flow distributions off investments, government, social security, pension. There's all kinds of things that could generate um, other streams of income, uh, little side hustles. Love and be loved. Live a life of gratitude. Never forget, give back and teach what you learn. This is critically important. Um, you know, here's kind of a picture of what my, my first passion is. We're actually going to start partnering with some um, housing assistance uh, through our fund. We're actually working on all that right now. We just, we're getting ready to launch that brand. I have the logo up here. I'll show you in a second, but um, we're really excited about that second venture. When I hit the million meals, we wanted to move on to another topic of need, which is, is affordable housing. So if you look here, you see Feeding America. I'm actually featured on their national website. I've been there for years and I'm going to be there indefinitely. Um, we're just going to change the amount of meals we've served here pretty soon, which is awesome. And I was put on there because of my story. So if you want to hear more about my struggles growing up, my story is actually front and center on Feeding America's website. You have to search um, why I give, but I'm, I'm in there for sure. And, um, you know, there's my book, You've Earned It, How I Refused Anything Less Than Success, and You Can Too. It's on Amazon. Um, it's ebook, Spanish, audio on Audible, and we have hard copy. I give these books away to kids uh, when I see them or do speaking engagements. I give them away at events I'm at. Um, but 100% of all my proceeds for that book have always gone to and will always go to Feeding America. So I've actually never made any money. It cost me about $9,000 to produce that book. And I've, I've never taken a dollar of profit from it whatsoever. And here is how you can reach me if you're curious. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about real estate as soon as we get done with this presentation. We'll put all your wonderful faces um, or pictures back up on the screen. But um, Sterling Rhino Capital, you can text the word uh, Rhino to 66866. That enters into, into our downloading our investment calculator and, um, and our um syndication guides and things of that sort. And then from there, if you're interested in investing, you can obviously jump on that way. But Charging Forward is my new podcast. Sterling Rhino Capital is my company. And then Global Housing Assistance Fund is our new investment fund um, that we just built and we're getting ready to launch. And that's for, that is for accredited investors only, but our, uh, our normal investment platform brings non-accredited and accredited in. So I know that was a ton of information. Um, I'd love to open it up for a few minutes about any questions there, and then we can deep dive into real estate as soon as Aaron brings me back in. So why don't you go ahead, Aaron, and when you guys are ready, we can deep dive into any real estate you want to cover. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, uh, just a, a, a little plug in, I was on Sterling Rhino's pod, podcast as well. So great. If you guys want to check that out, it's a great, great time I had with Chris. Yeah. Um, so, so Chris, one thing, um, and I, one thing that always intrigued me about you is, like you said, you know, you, you, you are who you are and you go this and you do this every day, you know, even on Sundays. Can you tell people how many books you read 
on um, negotiation and things like that when you was in the fray, when you was in another industry? Yeah, you know, this is this is a great question. And here, here's what I'd say. And the answer is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'm not kidding. I mean, whether it be ebooks or audiobooks. And you might say, well, that's crazy. How did you do that? Well, it's because I'm not like most people. I When I have free time, except for, let's say, being on Zoom calls, podcasts, and things of that sort, I'm consuming information. And part of that stems from the lack of education as a youth, right? I, 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 I neglected school. I didn't put the time in. So when I became an adult, I just consumed information uh, at, a, at an addiction pace, right? Uh, you can see stacks of books behind me, but all the real estate books, all the mindset books, um, all the books about entrepreneurship. It didn't matter if it's Trump, Robert Kiyosaki, um, you, you name it, I was consuming it. And now I'm on the way uh, to the gym. I'm, in, I'm on podcasts. I'm at the gym. I'm audiobooks. I'm on the road. I had a traveling job where I put 35,000 miles a year on my car. I was always listening to audiobooks. Sometimes round trip was five hours. Well, that was one or two audiobooks just in one day. Right. And so instead of being on the phone or listening to the radio all the time, uh, I was consuming information because um, I, to be quite honest with you, I always had a desire to feel worthy as I was growing up because I, I never felt worthy. I never felt like part of the team. I never felt like anyone um, wanted me as part of their world because I got jumped by gangs and I was picked on and I, I didn't have the education and the pedigree and the mom and dad and the white picket fence. And it's interesting because that crazy work ethic that I developed um, has voted well for me. And obviously today I don't have to worry about all that. Um, but that, that, that sort of crazy upbringing is what built that in me because that's not easy. I mean, who wants to spend all their free time consuming information to learn? It's kind of boring for most people, right? We want to watch reruns. Um, but I, I look at something, let's say I wanted to be a good salesperson. I looked at all the best salespeople and thought, what do they do really well? Some things I was willing to do, some I, I was not. And then I read books on that. How do I deep dive into that? And then I practiced, right? And that's how I did, that's how I did it all along the way with every business. It's no different than real estate, man. That's how we grew so fast. I was fixated on doing 100 units my first property. And I did it. And every building since has been 100 units. People were like, no, no, you got to start with five or 10 or 20. I said, no, I want 100. Well, how are you going to do that? I'm like, I don't know. I'll figure it out. And we did it, right? I never accepted that I had to start with 10 units like everyone was talking about, right? Um, that's, the, that's the short answer. There's obviously a lot behind that. But if you have free time and you can, please, please, please keep consuming information. But most of all, once you get to a point where you've consumed enough information, start taking action. That's why partners are great because they'll hold you accountable, right? Don't just read and go to seminars and not do anything about it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, so I got two more questions for you. I'm, I'm open up for audience, then we can definitely, uh, you know, uh, go from there. But okay, so when you know you talk about your background and things like that, have you always been as competitive as you've been since you've been in the in the business world? Have your competitive mindset? been that like that like i gotta beat others and that's what drives you more as well what's your mindset uh, the, yeah the answer is yes i'm extremely competitive um again most of that comes from that proving yourself concept when i was young right um it's funny i i played football my freshman year in high school uh, i remember friends and family had to get together to pay for the equipment because you had to pay for the equipment right just to rent the equipment it's ridiculous um, and ever since, ever since that time, I, I, I started to develop a little more confidence, right? Once you lose weight, you're playing football. Uh, I became an entrepreneur and I always remembered that how I felt when I lost the weight and became part of a team and all that. Um, it's really simple though, Aaron, most of my success is attributed to this. I show up early, I leave last and I work harder, more constant than almost everyone around me. Now, I didn't have to be a rocket scientist, right? I didn't have to be the best real estate guy. I didn't have to be the best sales and marketing guy. I actually didn't even have to have the best numbers. But when I was there before the vice president showed up and they saw me there first, and then they left before I left, and I was always willing to do things for everybody, um, that sort of not only built a confidence in me, but a credibility, if you will. 
And I kept doing it and kept doing it, kept doing it. And then all of a sudden these awards start coming along, right? And you might say, well, God, that's show up you know, first and leave last. And, but that starts to develop that mindset of hustle. And when you're putting more time in, you're going to consume more information that's going to educate you. And then once you can apply that knowledge correctly, right? Now you can start to become successful, right? But if you're only putting in one hour a week into your craft, how the hell are you going to do anything? You're not going to be successful. I mean, like I work two full-time jobs and guys, I could literally retire today and do nothing. I could sit on a beach all day, every day right now at 44 years old, but I would go nuts doing that. Right. So I work two full-time jobs because I love it. I manage my companies and then I run real estate. Right. Um, I hope that answers the question. It does. It does. It does. One more question. And then uh, we definitely open up for audience. Then we'll get into real estate. Um, what is your main, after all this time you've done, what is your main takeaway that you see from successful people to average people? Yeah, the, the, the well, a couple of things, but average people, and I hear this all the time, I've trained tens of thousands of salespeople in my, my first life, right? And I find oftentimes it's, it's not that we all can't do whatever it is we want to do, right? Um, for example, I, I see, uh, is it Deborah? I see her face on the call there. If I was to say to Deborah, Deborah, have you ever run a mile? Like, and she says, yeah, I've run a mile. It's like, well, what was your time? Oh, I ran in eight minutes. I ran in seven minutes, I ran in 10 minutes. Great. Have you ever thought about how fast you could ever run a mile? Like, have you ever even thought about it? Well, no, of course not. Well, why'd you run a mile in the first place? Well, I was on the track team. We had to do it. That's usually, the answer is usually I have to do it. I have to go to work, right? I have to read this. I have to study. I have to this, I have to that. We don't oftentimes think of how can I be better at what I'm doing all the time? How can I keep pushing so that there is no goal? There is no finish line. I just keep going. And the next day, I keep pushing to go even further and faster, right? Versus, okay, you know what? My goal is to do 150 units. Now I'm at 150 units. Well, I mean, maybe it'd be nice to do 250 units. There should never be a number. It should just be I want to rock real estate deals and I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to protect my investors and I'm just going to keep hustling every day. And I might be do 10 deals in a month, right? So the question I have, like say, for example, for Deborah or Desmond or anyone else on the call is, when was the last time you really challenged yourself, right? When was the last time you actually said, I'm going to, I'm going to push this limit beyond what I even possibly think I can achieve, right? Like climbing mountains like I did, right? I was scared to death of heights. I would never climb a mountain. And all of a sudden I'm not worried about it. I'm falling in crevasses. I got ropes. It's all good. Right? So the difference between low uh, performers and high achievers is high achievers believe that they're going to achieve all the time. There's a confidence level that oftentimes only comes from some form of experience in your life, right? It could be failures and you use those as ways to drive you. It could be a level of success that you crave, so you keep pushing for that success. And success is defined by different people in different ways. It's not just about money or business. It could be a healthy family. It could be a healthy relationship. It could be running a mile faster and faster and faster until you're a marathon runner or whatever, right? But you need those small levels of achievement to get a taste of what that success looks like. And you have to keep going and not put barriers in front of you, which in my opinion are sort of fixed goals. And what I find is high achievers, they think that way all the time. They're consuming, they're achieving. They're opening themselves up to understand that they don't know all the answers, right? I'm a CEO and founder of some, um, some pretty good companies, some big multi, multi-million dollar companies, but I still listen to everybody. It doesn't mean I have all the answers, but it means my partner says something, even if I have more experience, I stop and I go, well, can you explain to me your perspective, one? And then two, how strongly do you feel about that on a scale of one to 10? Do you feel like an eight, or a six, or a nine? And if he says, man, I feel like a nine, and here's my perspective, there's a good chance he's going to win me over in his way of thinking if he's very good at articulating that stance, right? I don't say I'm the CEO and it's my word and that's it. That's not how I've built my success. I built it through teams. I'm just good at managing teams, right? Um, that is the big difference is never giving up and never really setting firewalls in front of you, right? Forget the goals, have guidelines and keep pushing. Um, and then teamwork and opening yourself up to that sort of humility of you don't know it all just because you're rich or you have a title it doesn't mean anything, right? There you guys go. Um, anybody have any questions for uh, Chris about business or mindset, anything like that, or you guys want to go into real estate? So anybody, the floor is open. 
Okay, thank you so much, Aaron and Chris. Um, one of the questions I had was on your first 100 unit deal in the CRM, what was your biggest takeaway uh, obstacle? And after you done it, what did you learn from it on the first oh, deal? Oh man, is it Desmond? Is that your name? Yes, yes. Desmond, let me tell you, man, I, I hope you got about six and a half more hours to listen to this crazy <laughs> story. Um, we're actually writing a book about this story. So I'll give you the short story. So the first part is the way I found my first deal was somebody asked for help. Okay, this is critically important for you guys to be active. Somebody asked for help out in a network of like thousands of people, literally on a Saturday night, okay? And I responded and said, what do you need help with? And he said, I got a deal and I need help with everything, right? I instant messaged him. So I said, call me on Sunday morning. I'm going to the gym at eight, call me. He called me. We got into a conversation. I flew across the country two weeks later, right? 2,500 miles from Seattle to Georgia. Flew there, met with him and some other people. And from there, we started working on this deal. Um, I was responsible to raise all the capital. And fast forward a little bit, again, because this, this is a long story. Uh, the whole deal fell apart. He, he moved on. The original guy with the equity moved on, the earnest money. And I took over the deal, putting my own $50,000 down and rewriting the contract, renegotiated over an 11 month period, and then eventually closed that 100 unit deal. Right now, I'm going to fast forward that a bit for you. We just sold that deal. Okay. And um, I don't want to give away too much, but I'll tell you this we exceeded our performa, right, on that deal by. I think it was 300%, okay? Now that may not sound like a big number, but your performa might get exceeded by 20, 30, 40% if you're lucky, if you did a hell of a job. We exceeded mm -hmm. it by 300% on our sale price. The numbers are staggering, staggering, right? Um, what happened after? What did we learn? Well, here's what I learned. Um, and we'll announce that once we close. We're under contract right now, but... Um, we just closed another deal, but this was a different one. What did I learn? I learned you got to be very careful about the team members you pick, right? I learned that these are very complicated deals. They sound all fancy and pretty when you go into mentor programs and when you hear people closing deals, but these are hard guys. I mean, these deals are hard and they're not as hard if you have good people on your team, but they're still very time consuming. This deal, I had 400 of my own man hours in this deal before we closed, 400. Okay. But I'm going to make over a million dollars in profit on this deal. Okay. So I want that to sink in for a second. If I asked you today, right. Um, I will pay you $1,100 an hour in two years, but you need to put in a total of 800 hours. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do or how hard it's going to be, but are you willing to do it? Many of you would probably say, well, hell yeah. I'd do it for 1100 bucks an hour, right? So I want you guys to realize that these opportunities do come along and you can crush it, but it's going to start with the right team, which is why I start with that when we talk about this stuff. It's going to start with your right mindset and understanding that you're probably going to have to work two full-time jobs, right? But the rewards are going to be great when you get there. And understand that there's going to be mistakes made. Understand that it's not going to be fun sometimes, right? You're going to have to be humble. Um, and you're going to learn a lot, but if you have a few people to go alongside and help you, you're going to get there. You're going to do it. So what I learned was pick the right team, be ready to put in maddening hours, right? Especially if you don't have a really good team, um, and be patient, right? Just be patient, execute your business plan. And one last thing I would tell you guys along that note is the number one thing I learned that was but that was most important throughout this deal, this process. And as I said, we're, we're writing a book about this. It'll probably come out in the next six months is making sure that you manage your property managers in a way that you would be doing it if you were controlling the asset, right? So uh, in other words, you don't just hire a property management company and think, okay, I'm, I'm investing across the country or even in my own market. So I'm gonna hire these guys and they're, credit, they're credible. They have 25,000 doors or whatever you are still going to have to be involved in that process. And, and I would encourage you to actually dig in, have weekly calls with them the first three months or so, and really understand how they manage their people. 
because not everybody's going to be on the same page with hitting the performa and managing the numbers like you would. And if you don't have that expertise, you better find somebody that can help you understand that, right? I, I just posted a video on YouTube, um, the seven KPIs you measure with your property manager. I highly encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and watch that video. It's great. It digs into the top seven things. It's about 11 minutes, I think, of me digging into all the important things you need to be measuring your managers on. That is the number one thing we found that helped us along the way. And we did it very early and we had to learn because there was some things we didn't even know, but we stumbled through it. And now we're, we're, it's critically important to us. So I know that was a little long, but I think really relevant to the question. I hope that helped you, Desmond. Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Good. What Anybody else? Anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, all right. Well, so let's, let's probe on the real estate then, Chris. Sure. Sure. So what have, what have we done today? Um, we've part, we partnered with a couple of different people when we started, right? Um, a good way to get into a deal. Like we have a co GP club uh, on our website where people can actually raise and, and learn how to do these deals. It's not for everybody. You've got to be able to raise a little bit of money to do that. But that's a good way to get in with people, not just us. You could do it with others, I'm sure. Um, you might find somebody like Aaron who's like, hey, I've got some capital and I'm looking for someone to find me deals. And maybe you guys jump in together. Doesn't mean you guys have to be uh, business owners together in a sense. Yes, you'll be on the building LLC together. But it doesn't mean you guys have to join your LLCs together. You could be Joe's LLC and Aaron's LLC, and you guys go in together on the property LLC with three other people, and you guys run the asset together, right? Um, banks don't like to have more than five general partners. You can have quite a few, but they really don't like more than five, just so you know. Um, and that could be like a sponsor and four of you guys or something like that. But, um, but you can do that to get started, right? You, the key is you got to get started. You got to do something. And often number one question I get is, how do I get started? Like, what do I do first? Well, you got to identify the value proposition, what you're good at. You got to find a few partners or maybe some other people that are looking for help on their deals and just get that one deal under your belt, right? Because then it's going to grow from there. So we did that at first. I, had a, I was part of a mentor group and that mentor said, hey, I haven't done a syndication. Um, I've got one under belt. I've got a deal. Uh, what do you think, Chris, about building out the investor relations system, right? Because he had done JV deals. So um, I said, sure. I built out the entire investor relations system, not really knowing exactly what I was doing. Um, and we did a hell of a job. It worked out great. I had some help. My eventual co-owner, uh, Paul Wilcox, jumped in and he was on the deal too. And he helped. We had like eight different people in on that deal. And that's not an ideal way to do it. The lender was okay with it. It was a bridge lender. Um, but that's how a lot of people got in on their first deal. You know, they jumped in together. And then from there, we went on and did the other property I just told you about, which was crazy. That was actually my first deal, but it took so long to close. We got another one and closed it by the time I closed the first one, right? And then from there, uh, we got a two-pack deal, two properties. And then from there, we got three properties and then another property. And it's just gone gangbusters because now we've got the credibility with the lenders, um, I've got Fannie and Freddie debt under my belt. We've got the ability to close. I think we raised 20 or $22 million in the last two and a half years. We've done, like I said, 80 million. And then our fund has another 20 or 30 million or something like that. Um, and now we're out, we're building out systems and we're building out marketing strategy, right? So, you know, podcasts, social media, um, blog posts, um, web presence, on and on and on, interviews on podcasts. And then on the system side, we're building out things like real page. Um, we're doing things like ClickUp for our project management. ClickUp is free. You can upgrade, but that allows you like monday.com to allow, uh, to build out your uh, problem solving abilities. So let's say you guys got a deal. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on. You got to have a place to put all that stuff. So everybody's accountable. Right. And that's what, that's what ClickUp is really cool for. So that, so now we're in the, the systems build out. Um, we're obviously raising capital in lots of different ways. And uh, that's kind of what we're working on today. And then obviously social media, we're always working on that stuff. So that's a long story short. Um, 
but we can deep dive into any of that stuff, guys. I mean, we've done a lot of crazy deals. I mean, we've had fires at a bunch of deals and shootings. And I mean, it's just part of apartment living, right? We've turned communities around completely. I've received letters from city councils and calls from the chief of police saying, thank you for turning the community around and getting rid of all the riffraff. I mean, we've, we've done some awesome things for the community. It's been great, man. So yeah. Yeah. Any questions you guys have, man, I've done a little bit of everything. I'd be willing to even single families, fix and flips and land and construction. I've done all that stuff. Uh, I guess a uh, quick question. So, um, I guess, how were you getting your deals when you first started versus now? I guess, how has that changed over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. Who asked that question? Ah, uh, Fred. Sorry about that. Fred. Cool. Yeah. And that's okay, man. I just couldn't see you, man. <laughs> um, yeah. So Fred, that's a very good question. And actually what's funny is when I, when I first got into this space, the number one thing I heard was you got to get deal flow. You got to build investor relations or not investor. You got to build broker relations, right? Kept hearing that, hearing that. And I kept trying, man, I was leaving voicemails and I was emailing people and I'm getting all the stuff that's on like LoopNet for the last 17 years that nobody bought. Right. And I'm like, well, this isn't deal flow. Like this isn't relationships. Why? Because I'm nobody. I mean, I was nobody. It didn't matter that I had a sales and marketing company even, or that I had some experience or I'd written a book or any, none of that mattered, right? These guys want to know that you have the ability to close. You have to have the lingo down, right? And the only way you're going to gain credibility is literally irrit irritating someone so much that they just start working with you because they think you're never going to leave them alone anyway, right? Um, or you get on a deal with someone and show that you have some credibility, right? Um, for us, we got on a deal. And that allowed us to, to have a little bit of credibility. Hey, we're a GP, a general partner on this other deal. And I was, I think my ownership was 13% because I did most of the investor relations stuff, right? Um, and that gave me a little credibility. But what really gained my credibility was flying across the country, taking brokers out to dinner. And that's not cheap, guys, right? I mean, if you're in your own local market, it's easier. But like I flew across the country specifically to meet with some top brokers. I took them to dinner. They offered to buy. I said, nope, I bought. And then I sent them nice gifts when I got home, right? I know that sounds crazy, but you know what? Right after that, I got a two property deal, right? 250 units. And then right after that, I got a true off-market deal, real off-market, never went out. And those are hard, hard, hard to find. Even though they tell you they're off-market, they're not. They go to their top 10 syndicators, right? So, and then we're, we're just, we just closed that one today. That's the one that actually came to us off-market. So the answer to your question is, the only way to really build relationships with brokers fairly quickly is love them to death, right? Um, but most of all, find a way to get on a deal so you have some credibility, right? And the only way to do that generally is partner with quite a few people um, or be a co-GP. You could do that too. Like I said, we, we have a club that you can be on, but um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, especially if you're just starting. Um, it's better to just grab three or four of you guys together and say, hey, we can all raise a million bucks together. Let's go find a smaller deal. And that'll get the ball rolling, right? Um, I, I hope that answers your question, Fred. You got any more to ask on that? Um, that that answered it. You know, definitely uh, super aggressive on actually making sure you're getting in front of the right people. I guess I guess the only question I can think about that is um how you how do you, how did you decide on the market? Obviously, there's great um, there's great brokers throughout the U.S. So how did you pick the markets? And did you already have a ticket to Georgia, <laughs> or uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, how did you pick it and then find the brokers in that area and then go visit them? That is, that's another great question. Um, and here's what's funny. I told you guys earlier about my story growing up and overcoming adversities and challenges and whatnot. And I have zero fear in my life. I've actually, I've done videos on fear. Like I, I mean, I've gone through some crazy stuff, man. And when I, when I'm saying, the reason I'm saying this is, is it's relevant to your question because how did I buy a property living in Washington state in Georgia as my first acquisition at a hundred plus doors? That takes a lot of cojones to do that, right? Like, I mean, that's, I remember people going, oh, I would never do that. And it's like, well, why not? Well, because it's too hard to manage. Well, how do you know? Like, how do you know if you've never done it? And, and what about bringing people on that are in the state to help you, right? What about partnering? The limiting beliefs, right? It's like, we think we have to do it all on our own. And you don't, right? So to answer your question, here's how I did it, Fred. Someone asked for help, right? In a huge think tank. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, great, I'll help you. Where are you? And he said, well, we're in Georgia. And I said, I'll be there in two weeks. And I jumped on a plane and I went. And guess what? I ended up taking over the whole deal and closing the deal and actually owning more ownership than anyone else in the deal and became a millionaire off of one deal, right? Now, 
I was already a millionaire. And I'm not saying this to gloat, guys. I'm saying it because it's astonishing to me that someone could jump into this space, right? And do their first deal and hit it out of the park like that. That was not me, by the way, Fred. Like that was the team. That was having guts to be open to share with others and say, I trust you, partner. I trust you, partner. I trust you, partner. Let's do this thing together. And I'm going to do my best to lead everybody, right? Um, people backed out of that deal. Uh, and they're probably going to regret it when they hear what we did on that deal, right? It's crazy. Um, so that's how I ended up in Georgia. And I encourage all of you to broaden your horizons. But you got to find the right people if they're not in your local market. And believe me, you can make it happen. Don't be afraid of being in other markets. I would not have just chosen Georgia out of the gate. I was looking at all kinds of markets the first couple of weeks, right? And by the way, that, that call for help came within two weeks of me deciding I wanted to get into multifamily. Two weeks, right? And I got my first deal. It was crazy to me. So massive action. Be open to getting outside your comfort zone. Look all over the place for the right people to put on your bus or for you to get on their bus and you will find the opportunity. Don't be, don't be pigeonholed into the hottest market, Texas, Georgia, wherever. Start looking maybe in Ohio if that's better for you or Kansas or Oklahoma or whatever. If you got a friend on a think tank that's like, dude, I live in Oklahoma. I know some brokers or I've got net worth. I'm on the ground. Hey, man. Fred's good at raising capital. So Fred could bring maybe 300,000 or whatever. Well, now, now you got something. There's deals in Oklahoma, man. I mean, yeah. right? So that, I hope that that digs in a little more on your question. No, absolutely. Great, great cool. response. I appreciate that. Cool. Good, good. I'm an open book guy. So man, pepper me if you got questions. I think Chris has his hand up. Okay. Hey, Chris. Um, this is Chris. Uh, I just wanted to reach yes. out uh, and say thank you for coming today and all the knowledge you've shared already. I, I really appreciate all the effort. I, I just don't know how to show I'm, all the gratitude I have. I just have all the love for it. <laughs> hey, um, thanks, Chris. You saying it. I, I really appreciate that, man. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to, uh, to dig into the vault a little bit and find out... Um, your kind of favorite books for raising capital in real estate deals and, yeah. and then ho hopefully a business book as well. If you, uh, I got to, I see that stack behind you as well, <laughs> two stacks. I'm sure there's a bunch that you've gone over. Oh, so yeah. just a, a little bit of uh, gems there, if you would, are yeah. willing to open up to us. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips and it's going to probably surprise you as it relates to raising capital, but I'm going to give you a few tips about absorbing knowledge. Okay. Uh, one of the things I do uh, quite regularly um, is I will listen to audiobooks. I prefer them over paper because I'm busy. I'm driving. I'm all over the place, right? And I can keep re-listening to them. You know, I can go back to certain points fairly easily. So audiobooks is key for me. Podcasts are great, but audiobooks is great for me. That's my number one. Um, and then podcasts, those are my top two, right? But what I do is I have my notes on my phone, right? So, you know, those little Apple notes or whatever, Android or whatever, little notes. And mm -hmm. when I hear something great in an audiobook, I'll pause it. And I'll go to my voice recorder and I'll record a note. Chapter five, da, 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 such and such quote, or da, 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 about mindset or whatever. And I will make a few notes, not a lot, but a few notes that really stood out. The other thing I'll do is I get inspired constantly by my environment, right? I choose to be inspired by my environment. So I don't think negative thoughts, right? I mean, they come in and I push them out. When I hear a book and there's something that comes to mind, like, man, I want to do this, or I'm going to go try to do that. Maybe it's not even the book quote. It's just something that inspired a thought. You have got to get those thoughts down because you're going to lose them, right? So I encourage you, um, audiobooks, then podcasts, right? Um, maybe YouTube, but then podcasts, and then notes. Take notes digitally or audio record them. It's easy when you're driving to just hit the record button. You don't have to play with your phone. Just hit the record button. Hey, I just heard this from Stephen R. Covey and it was amazing. And it inspired me to think about this blog I want to write about X, Y, Z. And then it's done. Then I go back when I get home each night and I'll look at my notes and I go, oh yeah, man, that was a great quote or a great point about this real estate book I'm writing. Right. Um, so let me give you a few books. I hope that makes sense. Let me give you a few books. So capital raising where I built my foundation for my people skills. Right. Um, I think when I was in full-time sales, 
I sold over half a billion with a B, half a billion dollars worth of products and services, right? And a lot of these were small products. They weren't like RVs and stuff. Um, it was based on a foundation of two books, which was How to Win Friends and Influence People, okay? And The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, okay? Um, those two books built the foundation for me developing sales skills and how to deal with people critically important in raising capital. Okay. Critically important. Um, you can read all the real estate books you want, all the tips and tricks and the funnels and the smoke and mirrors and all the stuff. That's fine. But if you can't communicate with people, you're not mm -hmm. going to resonate with them. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're going to see you as just another syndicator and yeah, you are no, not going to stand out. No, I was talking more about kind of more Matt Faircloth's uh, like raising private capital type of type of books. But I'm, yeah, I'm going there. I'm going oh, there. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm going there. No, it's Just okay, Chris. I'm going there, man. I've read them all. I've I've read them all. And I and I know all those guys, right? Love it. So oh. here, yeah. So here's the deal. Um, the reason I'm telling you this first is because I don't want to tell you things you already know, right? You know you need to re read Matt Farthcross's book. It's one of the best books in the business. You Agreed. know that. It's yes, really, sir. it's really built for passive investors, not us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's built to funnel people to his investment firm because he's mm -hmm. teaching people how to invest in his company. And he mm -hmm. talks an awful lot about how not to invest in people like you that are starting mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. And the red mm -hmm. flags to look at. Nothing against Matt. He's awesome. The book is phenomenal. I, mm -hmm. I texted him and I'm like, dude, this is an amazing book. Like, thank you for <laughs> writing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing, guys. That's not all. That's not all of it, right? There, again, there's a bunch of stats and things. Let me ask you guys a question. Would you invest with me because I had a cool logo and I had a website and all this stuff? Or would you, or would you maybe invest with me more because you really got to know who I was? You got to know my culture. You got to know my company. You got to know our charity work, blah, blah, blah. In other words, you can get online and be smoke and mirrored by all kinds of stats and stuff, right? There, there are lots of techniques, but the key principle in raising money is understanding people. That's, that's it. Guys, we raised a lot of money pretty quick. And it wasn't because we were the top syndicators in the business, right? You know, our number one thing we hear from investors, number one, is we love you guys. We love your response time. We love how approachable you are. Nobody talks about our stats and our blogs. Nobody, right? So I'm going to tell you, yes, Matt Faircloth, uh, multifamily millionaire, Hunter Thompson, there are so many good real estate authors. Brandon Turner, gobble all of their books up. Absolutely. But if you want to learn people skills, which is ultimately how you're going to talk to investors and how you're going to communicate with them that they need to give you $100,000 of their hard-earned money when you don't have any credibility in this space, you're going to have to be one hell of a communicator. And I hope that makes sense. But you're going to have to do that if you want to excel quickly without the scaling and the and the credibility behind you, right? If you're Matt Faircloth, of course, right? Of course. I mean, he could be out there and say, I'm Matt Faircloth, check out my book, check out my website, check out my 2,000 units. I think he's got 3,000 now, right? Yeah, something um, like but that. But most, most of us couldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the other books, um, all the millionaire mind books get your mind right for saving because if you don't have a little money to put into your software and your systems and investing in some of your marketing or whatever, it's going to be a little harder for you, a little more time consuming, right? So you're going to want to make sure that you're smart with your money. You're going to want to make sure that you're educating yourself, not just in real estate, but in mindset and psychology, right? In communication, in speaking. Listen to me on this call. I don't know what you guys think of me and my communication skills, but you're talking to a kid who was terrified to raise his hand in class because I was always wrong. I felt totally stupid every time I gave an answer. That is no exaggeration. I was scared to death. That's why I didn't finish school. I just didn't feel like it was right for me, right? Um, but here I am articulating perfectly fine on multi-million dollar assets. Why? Because I understand communication. I'm confident because I've done something in my life, right? And I want to give back and help. And I love this stuff. I love working with you guys. So um, I've got a whole list I can read off from behind me, but those first two books are critically important. And yes, gobble up everything from Brandon Turner, uh, Matt Faircloth, Hunter Thompson, um, Joe Fairless, uh, amazing book on real estate. Um, if you want to learn how to raise capital, 
you need to go join up with Good Egg Investments. They will teach you everything you need to know about raising capital and systems and software. 100% get in their network. We love those ladies. They're amazing. Um, full disclosure, I get nothing for referring them. Um, I'm just letting you know they are, in my opinion, the best in the business. And, uh, and they'll guide you on how to build out your systems and infrastructure. They're not cheap when you start going up into the higher levels. But in the very beginning, basics, getting into their networks and such, very inexpensive. Um, good egg investments. They're amazing. Um, I hope that answers your question, Chris. And like I said, I can turn around and read a bunch of books off to you. But a lot of my books are not real estate books. I've read them all. But my top books are actually mindset books. They're millionaire books that got my head right in the money game um, and things of that sort. I love it. That definitely answered my question. Thank you so much for, for sharing also some of the connections too. You know, if, cool. if it's, if it's left a good impression on somebody like you, then, you know, that's, that's always the easiest way to, to get more attention, get more of the, the right kind of attention. So I appreciate you, all your knowledge. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah. No problem, Chris. Absolutely. Mr. What else? Hines. Hey, th thanks again, Chris. Um, really great information. I was just wondering more like going forward, you know, it's a, I wouldn't say uncertain, but it's hot times. You know, you, you have a very unstable or uncertain industry market. You know, supply chains are like, like I'm trying to do a value add in Kansas City. And my, my, uh, like my property manager is like, you know, not on the fence, but they're hedging their bets as far as labor and uh, material costs because, you know, you know, everything's not, not really standard this time. What are you doing in this? Like, how are you like managing your units or setting your company going forward to like handle like either a change in interest rates or, you know, handling this supply chain, you know, stuff where like, you know, appliances might take six, eight months or something like that. Are you scaling back on your renovations or are you, how are you sort of dealing these uncertain times? That's a very good question. It's Kenneth, right? Uh, yeah. Here's the answer to that, Kenneth. Um, first of all, we don't know the future, right? Um, I suppose for some of you, whether it's Buddha or God or whatever you believe in, probably only knows. Um, so none of us certainly know what's going to happen. Uh, I can tell you this, Kenneth, and I'll give you some insight into my thoughts, but I'll tell you this. When I first started in this business, um, COVID was right around the corner, right? And everybody was bailing out. Everybody was holding up. Everybody was talking about the doom and gloom. I can quote two top syndicators that talked about, don't buy. Don't buy. There's going to be a fire sale right? Don't buy during COVID. It's going to be crazy. There's going to be sellers all over the place that are just dumping their properties left and right. And I thought that was crazy because when COVID started, I knew based on historical data that this wasn't going to be a massive economic crash as it relates to real estate, mostly because it's real estate issues are supply and demand issues, right? Um, look at 2008, right? Um, we had a massive supply and demand shift which is what caused all those major issues. Of course, forget the banks and all that. That's obvious. We had a massive shortage that we had never caught up on when COVID started. We had a major inventory problem when COVID started. And I knew that just because we had a virus, it wasn't going to change that, right? Now, that didn't mean that I knew what was going to happen financially, but it meant that multifamily was still going to be a viable place to be. And I couldn't see any reason why somebody would dump their property as a result of COVID. I just I couldn't see it, right? Um, because if for every 10 people that maybe were in trouble financially, there was 200 syndicators willing to pay top dollar for their property, right? Even during COVID. And that's exactly what happened. Now, I didn't know that exactly, but what did I do during COVID? I bought four properties during COVID, the first year and a half of COVID, right? Then the next half, we're buying properties still. And those properties, two of them are exiting now. And I'll tell you right now, one of those properties is 46% annual returns that we just sold. And the one that we're selling next way out exceeds that, exceeds that, way exceeds it. Now, had I listened to all the top, not top, some top guys, I probably would have sat on the sidelines and I would have been like, oh my God, like COVID, I don't, I don't know enough. I don't, instead what I said is what don't I know and how can I feel more comfortable with it? So Kenneth, to your point, you're right. There's chaos. Okay. We got deals that we were looking at $16,000 a door to fully renovate class A type build outs, solid surface, stainless steel, you name it. And we're getting bids all of a sudden at 20,000 
and we budgeted 16. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, thankfully, we raised a lot of extra capital to account. But when we first started this process, it was like, oh, yeah, 16. Well, then three months later, it was like, well, guys, I'm sorry. Those container freight rates caught us, and we're 20,000. We're like, but wait a minute. We got your bid here. Yeah, guys, what do you want us to do? Like, we can't, the price is the price. So all you can do to hedge what could potentially happen with increases, and know it's coming, okay, is underwrite conservatively, raise a few hundred extra thousand dollars if that's what you have to do. You may have to lower your returns a little bit. People are still going to invest. Kenneth, remember, you buying a property and having to adjust and be a little more conservative is no different than me having to do it or Joe Fairless having to do it or anyone else having to do it, right? But it doesn't mean we run and hide and get scared and like go crazy. It's just part of the business. And remember, guys, that while all that chaos is happening, everyone's wages are starting to creep up. And they're going to continue creeping up because employers are not going to have a choice, right? A lot of that is because there's high demand for workers right now, right? It's the right thing to do. And everything is going up for everybody. You've heard that term, a tide raises all ships or whatever. That's exactly what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, interest rates start climbing. We're at crazy historic low interest rates right now. Like, so what if they go up? So what if they go up to 5% in the next two or three years? So what? Everything else is going to go up. You know what else is going up? Rent, right? I have a property that was $550 a month in rent. Do you know what we're getting on that property 19 months later? $1,000 a month in rent, guys. Okay. $550 to $1,000. I mean, and you know what that is in cap rate? It's like five, it's like $5 million or something, $4 million or something in valuation. So don't be, um, here's the, Stephen Covey says, don't get caught up in the thick of thin things. Amazing quote. Don't get caught up in the thick of thin things. Think about circles around you. There's the nucleus, the most important things you're dealing with. Then there's these outer rings that sort of catch our attention and influence us and scare us and take us off track. That's what you've got to avoid. Ken, if, if you're smart with your underwriting and you guys underwrite conservatively, raise a little extra money and plan, yeah, it's going to be harder to find deals maybe, but remember, you're doing the exact same thing the rest of us are doing, right? You just have to have the mindset of that we're all doing it together. You're not on your own. You don't have to be fearful. Everything's going up. It's going to happen. But believe me, properties are still going to be bought and sold left and right, right? Does that answer? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, Robert Aragona, and then after that, we're going to end the meetup. That doesn't mean we're going to end everything. They just want to end the uh, recording. So go ahead, Mr. Aragona. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Aaron. Nice to meet you, Chris. Um, I remember meeting uh, Matt way back then when he was first starting out, Faircloth. Uh, I believe he's from Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, he <laughs> might still have that property on Broad Street. It was like a, 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 he, like a little business center. He had there, but um, anyway, um, what I do is in the funding world. I uh, tr try to provide the best loans and mortgages for all these great real estate folks. When I first started out, probably over 18 years ago, I've been doing a lot of asset-based lending, B2B companies, receivables, PO funding, all that type of stuff. I added the real estate because I always got requests for uh, people looking at the small, smaller properties, you know, your duplex, triplex for looking to buy these properties. So I want to know uh, what should I be doing to get in front of maybe larger type deal requests, because I can take the same amount of time doing a small property to something large, a, a large multifamily, either a bridge loan, a mortgage, you know, um, fixed yeah. rate or whatever type of mortgage it is. To, to bring that capital to buy these uh, properties. Yeah. You know, so, uh, Robert, it's Robert, right? Yes. Cool. So I'll give you the short version. The short version is one, it's about, it's about scale access. Um, it's about a wider net. Okay. So um, if you want to generate business uh, utilizing, let's say the sales of your craft, for example, Hey, I've got great rates or the gift to gab or relationships, or I'm, I can get creative. You have to get out to a wider net. Well, how do you do that? Well, Michael Blanc has a great Slack channel, thousands of people in it, right? And he's a multifamily syndicator. He sells mentor programs. Phenomenal. I was in many of his programs, right? Um, 
Um, I'm probably going to be speaking at one of his events coming up. Um, I would get into his network. There's a lot of people in there looking for help. A lot of people looking for debt, right? Um, these meetups, they're smaller, but word of mouth. Uh, Robert, what you need to get really good at, and you sort of summarized it for me, but there's there's not enough sizzle there, right? It's like, Robert, I, I know a lot of people that do that, right? So why is Robert so special? Why, why What is Robert's value proposition in this space? For example, Robert, what you might have is a single sheet sort of mock-up, something cool and simple for the lay person to understand, right? Because a lot of us are new in this space is, hey, man, this is what I do. This is how I can help you. Here's the many things I've done. Uh, please spread the word. And you share that on these meetups, right? Hey, man, can I get your email? Or you even put it in the chat or you send people to your website. Like I've got to text the word Rhino. I mean, we've got lots of calls to action for our stuff, but a text word is 20 bucks a month, man. 20 bucks a month. You got a text word and all you do is connect it to a URL on a basic landing page of a website and boom, everyone texts the word. They got all your information and now they can find you and maybe see if your services are going to be... Um, important to them, right? But you got to get into the masses because I'll get off this call and I won't remember a lot of you folks. I'll remember the cool conversations, but I mean, I talk to thousands of people, right? I get people come up all the time, but people remember me for one, one reason or another, probably because I have so much energy, right? And you tend to remember that in people. I know I do versus monotone or um, no like call to action, right? So I don't have a connection with you or whatever it may be. So I would say, Robert, if you have something to offer, something to give, make sure everyone knows what that is exactly, and then leave them with a call to action to connect with you, right? It could even be LinkedIn. Um, that way you're, you're getting a hold of them on a more personal level and you need to get out to more people. So I hope that helps, but there's tons of real estate meetup groups. They ask you not to promote, but there's a great way to get your message out without promoting. You know, you can make comments on debt and stuff. And all of a sudden people are like, I mean, this guy really knows what he's talking about, right? Um, I mean, think about it. It's how I found my first deal, right? It was a guy reaching out and I'm like, oh, hey, I, I'm interested. Like, why am I the only one that reached out to him? Like, right? I got this amazing deal from that. Why? Because I simply cared, right? It's crazy. So I hope that answers your question, Robert. Yeah, very good. Thanks for your advice. Yeah. Um, we started one more. Does anybody have another question for uh, Chris? And Don's definitely right. I mean, this is this is uh, next level uh, teaching right here that Chris is doing, and um, you know, I love his energy. Uh, and um, like I said, I mean, check his episode out on the Capital Razor Show. Um, just this great, great, and, and you know, a lot of a lot. I, I listened to it this morning, Chris. Actually, I wanted to re listen this morning to that episode. Man, I love it. And, do you do it uh, just actually, to wake you up in the morning? Is that what you did, Aaron? Just well, to get was, you jolt, like wake you up? <laughs> hey, man. Hey, you know, it gets it gets me going. It gets me going, man, because, I mean, your journey and what you have done and then just talking to you one-on-one -on -one and your work after this is it's just a festish, man. I love it. And, and and it's crazy, too. The next guy, next week is Ruben. <laughs> he's a next oh, guy. Awesome. Speaker, so. <laughs> Great guy. So, and, and you know, he, he's high strong. So, um, yeah. So, um, man. Um, so, look, I'm, I'm going to um, just uh, I'm record. But I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we do this every week at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if anybody has anything, uh, anything you want to, um, you know, always, uh, you can always message me. And uh, always remember that you're one call away from changing your whole life. So just always remember that. Keep charging forward, like Chris would say. And uh, take care. God bless you. And remember, one more thing, we are affiliate of the, of the GOB Network. The GOB Network will have, GOB will have a conference in June in Chicago. So more information to come. All right. Thank you, guys.